Father, in Jesus' name, I just think of those that are suffering even right now. Lord, just reach out and touch them, encourage them, strengthen them, heal their bodies. Father, all we can do is pray and trust in you. Now, Lord, as we turn to the word of God, bring it alive. Let it touch us. Let it encourage us. Let it strengthen us as we walk out our life before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn to, to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. As I had mentioned a couple of weeks ago, it was no accident that the Lord Jesus was crucified on Passover. Not only did he die on Passover, he rose from the dead. And this was not a happenstance. This was planned by God that he should die at this time of year. There were other great feasts, seven great feasts of Jehovah. And yet, and yet, and yet, God chose this one. So for me, it means that when we want to study what the world calls Easter, we call Passover. We need to look into the original happening. And so here we are in Exodus 12. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Can somebody grab the mic back here for me? If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people you are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they're to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they're to eat the lamb. Jumping down to verse 13. And the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. <clears throat> and when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day that you're to commemorate for generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, as a lasting ordinance. Look at verse seven. Take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames. You know, those people had to trust that when the God of creation sent the death angel through the land, that he would stay over the houses where that blood was. That he would cause that death angel to go around that house. I was just thinking this morning on the way here, it, you know, it absolutely was not that God needed them to put the blood on the doorposts so that he would know where the Jews lived. It wasn't a marker for him. He said they're to take some of the blood and put it on the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lamb. This will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. 
It meant that when they put that blood up there, it was going to be a sign for them that they were going to be saved. It also meant that if they weren't in that house where the blood was, Jewish or not, their firstborn would die. If they were Jewish, or even if they were Egyptian, if they had put the blood on the doorpost as God had commanded, they would have been protected. And as a matter of fact, when you read the story of the Exodus, you discover that it was a mixed multitude that came out. It was not just Israeli Jews. It was Gentiles as well. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. As I showed you a couple of weeks ago, that word Passover doesn't exactly mean how we, what we translate it to in English. It means I will pass and stay over you. I will put a dome, if you will. I will put a protection over you. I will put a hedge around you. I will stand guard over you. And no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. I'll tell you, that's a promise. That's a promise. It must have been awful scary when they realized what was going to happen. And it was coming up to 1159. Parents grabbed their children because they knew that at midnight death was going to strike from the prisoner in the jail all the way to the palace. And they held their children tight, but those who are under the blood were protected. It must have been a fearful event. But those who trusted in the blood had nothing to fear. They ate their dinner with their staff in their hands and their clothes on and their coat on, ready to go. Because God had told them, eat it in haste and be ready to go. And sure enough, when that moment came, the order from the palace was given and Israel was finally released because they had stayed under the blood. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 4, here John is writing under the unction of the Holy Ghost. And he says, John to the seven churches of the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. You see, we look back on those people and we can see what they were going through and how they had to trust in the blood. But I wonder if you realize you too have to trust in the blood. You too have to trust in what Christ has done. You too have to stand firm in what the Lord has done. Trust in his blood. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests, to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. To him who has loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. In the Old Testament, they were huddled in their houses under the blood. In the New Testament, we have been freed from our sins by his blood. In the Old Testament, 
They were huddled in their homes, having killed the Passover lamb and placing the blood on the house in the New Testament. The blood is upon our lives and the doorposts of our hearts. And we too trust in the blood. We depend upon the blood. Amen. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, it says this. 1 Peter 1, 18. It says, For you know that it was not with perishable things like silver and gold. Funny, isn't it? We don't really... We don't really consider silver and gold to be perishable. Gold and silver is often passed down in families for generations. It doesn't appear to be something that's perishable. And yet one day, all of that will perish. God will take this world and roll it up in a ball and toss it into the sun. It will be destroyed by fire. And so everything we think is permanent is perishable. For you know that it's not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, handed down to you from your forefathers. The redemption that came to you didn't come by the tangible, physical stuff of this world. It came from something more precious. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. A lamb without blemish or defect. Peter is taking us back right here to Passover. It was the blood of the lamb without blemish or defect. He is reminding us of the time when Christ died. It was Passover. And the lamb that they would put to death had to be without blemish or defect. Just as Christ is without blemish or defect. And his blood is as efficacious today as it was the day it was shed. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. He was chosen before it all started. Before Adam and Eve, God knew, Jesus knew exactly what he would do, when he would do it, how he would do it, in what order he would do it. And when the time was right, he came and he died right on time. You know, nobody dies late. And believe it or not, nobody dies early. Every one of us has an appointment with the grave. Unless the Lord comes back. And we will go right on time. In Galatians chapter 3, it says this. Verse 1. Possibly one of the best verses in the New Testament. Galatians 3.1 You foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Our Lamb without blemish, was clearly portrayed to them as crucified. I would like to learn one thing. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Now, what's the point here? He's saying, I taught you clearly about the death of our Lamb and that you have been set free from your sins. Now, he said, did you receive the Spirit of God by what you did or by what you believed? Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit? 
Are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe in what you have heard? Is God doing the great things that God is doing because you are an exemplary human being or because of his mercy, his grace, and what he has done on that cross? He has shed his blood on that cross and that is the only grounds by which we receive mercy and grace and forgiveness. And we have to trust in the blood. Maybe, maybe, maybe there are some of you out there who have trouble forgiving yourselves for some of the things you've done. David said on one occasion, my sins are ever before me. My sins are ever before me. It was his way of saying, I can't forget the things I've done wrong. And to some degree, that's not a bad thing because you probably won't repeat them again. I say probably. But... If they live in the forefront of your mind, then the next step beyond that is this. I can't pray. I can't come to God. I, I can't speak to Him. Why? I can remember what I did. Friend, you need to trust in the blood. You need to trust in the blood. As those people in the Old Testament had to trust in the blood, you need to trust in the blood. Trust in what Christ did on that cross. Trust in his finished work. Yes, you messed up in the past. And guess what? You may mess up in the future. And the good news is, it'll be a whole different mess up from the last time. What you need to do is get up, shake yourself off, Dust yourself off, have a nice shower, put on some good clothes, and carry on. Get back on the horse and carry on. When I was a young boy, we used to horseback ride a great deal. And I loved riding horses. I would go down to the ranch there with my dad, and we'd go riding. One, one day we came in and the horse that I rode was out. Somebody had already rented the horse. His name was Flicka. Well, Flicka wasn't available that day. And I was just a little guy. Probably not much more than about six or seven. And they said, we don't have Flicka today, but we have Jolly Roger. Well, I, I didn't know what Jolly Roger was. But it turned out Flicker was a little horse and Jolly Roger was a giant. He was the Goliath of the stable. And he was a trained barrel racer. If any of you have been to the Calgary Stampede, you know what I'm talking about. They race them around the barrels and the horses are very specially trained for that and they stuck a little child on that horse. I think you can possibly guess what comes next. Jolly Roger took off and little Philip stayed behind. Yes, but I didn't just stay behind, I ended up falling on my behind. I was thrown from the back of that horse as he reared up like Roy Rogers' horse. And I was tossed onto the ground. And my dad did the cruelest thing you can think of, which was the best thing he ever did. He got off his horse, came along, said, son, 
get up, stop crying, and get back on the horse. I can tell you, I was hurting. I did not want to get back on that horse. I didn't trust him. I didn't like him. And he was 10 feet taller than I was. But they put me back on the horse and I rode him for the rest of the day. <laughs> to this day, I have no fear of horses because I got up and got back on the horse. And sometimes you need to stop licking your wounds. Stop nursing your hurts. More will come along, I promise you. Stop licking your paw and get up and get back on the horse, trusting in the blood that God has forgiven you. <laughs> That even though you have sinned, he has stayed over you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never walk away from you. He will see you through every situation. Well, in Galatians chapter 2 verse 19, it says, for although the, although the law, for, pardon me, for through the law, I died uh, to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body. I live by the faith. By faith in the son of God. Who loved me. And gave himself for me. I don't set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained. Through the law. Then Christ died for nothing. You see, the Galatians had a problem. They were doing what many people today in many churches around the world doing. They were trying to work for their salvation. They were very good at making others feel less spiritual than them. Because after all, they pray for two hours, you only pray for one hour. They fast for this length of time, you don't fast at all. And they had so many of these little rules and regulations and things, and Paul has to come along and say to them, you foolish Galatians, what are you trusting in? Your abilities? All of us, are hypocrites whether we like it or not the only one that was good was Christ and we depend upon him we rely upon him we trust in his blood as the Jews of old gathered in their huts gathered in their homes held on to their children and had to trust in the blood that when that death angel came through the land, it would not strike their home because the blood was on the doorposts. So, we too, when we shuffle off this mortal coil, when we separate from this world, we have to trust in the blood that we will be walked into heaven taken into the presence of the Lord and given a welcome that says, well done, true and faithful servant. In Hebrews chapter 9, it says this, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through a greater, more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not part of this creation. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained, and here it is, eternal redemption. <laughs> Amen. Not temporary redemption. You are not redeemed until you blow it. 
because most of us won't even make it home today before we have done something that would cause us to lose our salvation. There are some denominations that believe if you're dying, you must repent before a priest. You must be administered the last rites and so on. If you want to make it past purgatory. Well, let me tell you something. None of that is found in the Bible. What is found in the Bible is this. For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but will have everlasting life. <laughs> the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they will be outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. I don't know if you really heard that. I want you to hear verse 14 again. I want it to ring in your mind. I want you to go home and toss this over and chew on it like good food. Hebrews 9, 14. Here it is. How much more then? First of all, let's start with what that means. He's been talking about the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a red heifer and how it made people ceremonially clean. Now he's going to come from that and compare it with the blood of Jesus. Now watch what he does. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences. Do you have a sin on your conscience? Do you have a sin on your conscience you just can't forgive you for? Maybe some don't. But you will at some point. If you have a sin on your conscience that you just can't let go of, then verse 14 is for you. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? You see, what happens is this. If you're not trusting in the blood and you're trying somehow to work out your sin issue, you are paralyzed before God. You will never come before God with comfort and ease. But if you have been saved and you are trusting in the blood, then the acts that led to death have been forgiven and not only that but he will cleanse your conscience from worrying about those things you can let him go you can forget him you'll be all right so that we may serve the living God this is so that we can get up and get on and carry on we don't have to sit back there and say but God I'm such a failure At a certain point, that's just pride. Lord, I'm a failure and I'm proud of it. Get up, shake it off, repent to God, and carry on. <laughs> Serve the Lord with everything that is within you. Well, amen. He is our propitiation. He is our Savior. There is none like Him. 
In the book of Hebrews, it says this. Amen. If I can find the right page. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. Day after day, the priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. All they could do in the Old Testament was cover sins. In the New Testament, the blood of Jesus takes away sin. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, that's Jesus, he sat down at the right hand of God. By the way, no priest ever sat down because the job was never done. Jesus sat down because it was finished. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be his footstool because by one sacrifice he's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Listen to that verse again. Because by one sacrifice, the death of Christ, the blood of our Lamb, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Listen to it again. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever. Do you realize he called you perfect? You might say, but I'm not perfect. I'm very far from perfect. In God's eyes, you're perfect. Have you ever looked at something or someone you loved and just said, you're perfect? In spite of their imperfections, you're not looking at their imperfections. You're not looking at their failures. You're not looking at their weaknesses. You're looking and saying, you're perfect. And God is looking at you. He is not looking at your sins. He is not looking at your failures. He's not looking at your weaknesses. He is saying, you're perfect. <laughs> because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now, you're not necessarily holy yet. You're being made holy. The Holy Spirit testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I'll make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I'll put my laws on their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember. No more. <laughs> Amen. I will remember no more. Praise God. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. In other words, once your sins have been forgiven, there is no longer any need for another sacrifice. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence into the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, a new and living way is open for us through the curtain that is his body. What's it saying? It says this, since we are now able to come before God and we are no longer burdened by the sins that we have committed, a new and living way is open for us. We come through the body of Jesus. We come through the blood of Jesus. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let's draw near to God. Was sincere with a sincere heart, full of assurance and faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. You have been cleansed by the blood. Let's hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Hold unswervingly. And let's consider how we may spur one another on to work good deeds. I tell you this.
just as they had to trust in the blood, so we have to trust in the blood. We have to trust that we have been washed. We have to trust that our sins are forgiven. We have to put aside the thoughts of failure and weakness. And remember that he has cleansed even our consciences. And now we have to get up and get on and serve the Lord with everything that is within us. All, not a few, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so it is by his grace and mercy that we are allowed to continue. By his grace and because of his mercy, he has washed us in the blood. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the blood. We thank you, Father, that you have purchased us and paid for us in the blood of your own Son. That you loved us that much. Help us, Father, to move beyond our own failures and weaknesses and to serve you with everything that is within us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in your cars, You should have your communion. And if ever there was a wonderful time to be taking communion, it's when you've just heard a sermon on the blood. How 